thanks for joining us today. So this event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events. This is one of such events. So if you want to find uh, more about our events, you can go to our website, which is Data Talks Club slash events, and you'll find a list of uh, events there. Then to stay up to date with events and our uh, other activities, you can subscribe to our newsletter, join our Slack, and uh, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, during uh, the talk today, you can ask any question you want, and uh, you can use a slider for that. So there is a pinned link in the live chat. So just click on this link and ask any question you want, and then at the end, we'll um, cover this question. And this is something that we, um, this is something new that we have. Um, I know that many people are not watching this live, um, but instead watch uh, the recording afterwards. And we decided to experiment with uh, asking questions asynchronously. So if you're watching uh, this event right now in recording and you want to ask something about, uh, about the talk, you can go to our Slack events Q&A uh, channel and ask your question there. And I asked uh, Roman to, to be there for a couple of days to keep an eye on this channel. So he'll be answering questions there. And that's all from me. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please, you can start. Uh, hello, I'm going to share the screen one more time. And like this, yeah. So. Is it working? Probably. Uh, so, hello. Uh, my name is Grovenikov Roman. I'm going to talk today about reinforcement learning in search. And there is just a couple of uh, words about myself. So I switched from academic career to data science quite a lot of time ago. This, this it's probably me screaming uh, after trying to do some academic career. I've worked in some areas, in different areas, like for doing trading robots for NASDAQ, for predating credit risk, and now for the last five years, I'm working in e-commerce in a company called Finify, working on the relevancy and ranking. And you probably never heard about this company because it's a, it's a white label search. So when you go on a online store and which is not amazon like it's, it's like a brand store and you use search there you use product listing you use recommendations so these are ranked by findify but you'd never even notice that it's a separate widget separate company it just looks organic and it's tight it, uh, put into the design of the store uh, we are not that huge we are not amazon and not zalanda but we have approximately 20 million products in our index, and we have approximately 50 million unique visitors using our search rankings and so on and so forth. And uh, the stock itself is about personalization. So yeah, it's reinforcement learning and search technically, but uh, the the main idea of ranking is that uh, the relevance itself is quite subjective. So when you type socks on a store, uh, you and your child might think about different socks. So the ranking can be different for different people. So if there is a way to make it more personalized, you might like have a win-win situation for both the visitor and both the store in general. So it's just a story about how what we try to do in this area, and probably in a wrong way, what we try to do in this area, probably in the right way, but still there is an asterisk there saying that it's it's your mileage with my very, so it's our personal experience, and probably it's also wrong. Who knows? And uh, some tools and solutions which you can use in theory to solve these problems, but uh, hopefully. And but uh, when we are talking about ranking, we need to understand that it's not only about search in e-commerce. Ranking is a very general idea, general thing to observe in uh, ever, in, in the everywhere in everywhere in the internet. So it can be search. You type the query on the search engine or on a store, and you get a ranking of products. 
but you can't have no query at all. It can be just a list of products on the store. Sorry, my, most of my slides are e-commerce focused because like, why not? Uh, it also can be a recommendation widget. The ranking of items in the recommendation widget is also quite important. Uh, it can be a news store, a news, a news blog, or just a news website. There can be just zero context in general, but there can be ranking. And the current state of ranking for different tiers, for recommendations, for product listings, for news listings, and for search are three completely different words, worlds. We, for this talk, will be mostly focusing on search, but the ideas which we are going to define and discuss are quite generic and can be applied to any other area. For example, to recommendations with just a minor modifications, but we need just to understand what's going on there. How can it be applied? And when you're going to search, for example, you have a website and you have a search which returns a list of products and how these products are ranked. You're probably not you not tuning it directly inside of your Elasticsearch uh, tool, but probably it's ranked by the BM25 algorithm. And if you go to Wikipedia or Google and see what how what what is this BM25? Sorry for this scary formula. You don't need to understand it, but the main important thing is that the whole formal is mostly focused on the term frequency, like on a word frequency. What the word frequency for in the query? What's the word frequency in the document? How do these word frequencies intersect with each other between the document and the query? How many words in the query itself, and so on and so forth. But it's still focused on term frequencies. And when you, but sometimes, and usually the sometimes means almost every time, uh, ranking only by BM25 might be quite an odd idea. So I just got on Zalanda and typed jeans here which is like, why don't I just type jeans on the land? And I get 16,000 types of jeans. I'm not going to scroll over 16,000 products. I'm interested in the top maybe five, maybe top 10. And uh, usually in these cases, this is top 10 products will have the same BM25 score. And you don't know how should you rank them because it's just here jeans and the title's jeans. So what what we're going to do with this ranking? And um, uh, that's a histogram of click positions for Findify across all the different stores we run. And you might want notice that most of the clicks, like five half of all the clicks, are happening within the top five positions. It can be different for different verticals. It can be different for different areas. It's not maybe different for news blogs and so on. But still, top queries, uh, top items collecting most of the queries. And here is just a desert. No one goes there. It's just we got spoiled by Google that if the relevant item does not exist in the first three results, it doesn't exist ever. We just have some better things to do in our life than just scrolling the search results. And uh, the second page is just doesn't exist usually. For Findify, it's approximately 5% of the visitors visiting the second page. So it can be just disregarded in general. And if you are in e-commerce or if you really care about the customer or uh, the visitor journey on your website, on your store or whatever, uh, you need to know that the, 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 the focus of the customer is very fragile. It's extremely easy to lose a customer if you provide him a bad, a bad ranking. No one will scroll down. Probably the, customer, the visitor will just close your page and leave, probably forever. So we need to focus on the top something products to be really relevant. And if we are smart enough, we might define the idea that why don't we run a rank not only by this like a text relevancy, but also introduce something else, which is more domain dependent, like number of clicks on the item, which is quite a smart idea. So for example, we have three products here with their BM25 score is quite close to each other, but the popularity, the number of clicks is absolutely different. So we might combine it together and get another score on top of this two. And we might assume that even if it has a bit lower BM25 score, but more popularity, it should be ranked like higher. It seems like a wonderful and interesting idea, 
in, in theory, but we are not going to stop all this. Why don't we just, uh, we know that it can be improved even with this particular number of clicks here. We can add more constants to tune to get a better ranking. It's a wonderful idea. And then we can also add page use, purchases, cards, computed over the windows of different time frames, And we get more context to tune. And then at the end, we'll get a uh, something very, very complicated. And it means that it's just a very fragile and you need to tune a lot of context, co constants to make this formula fit the real world and to improve the situation in the real world. And it won't work if you put parameters randomly. So it means that it needs training. And we're coming into the area of learn to rank. Learn to rank is an area of, of uh, machine learning which is focused on ranking problems, because ranking problems is a uh, has some very specific uh, use cases and error functions and algorithm that can be specific to this area, and we're going to talk about that a bit later. So, but if we see our nice constant ranking formula with constants as a regression problem, what should we optimize for? Like if it's a regression problem and if we go for mean square error here, it means that if we have two products like with the same input features, like the same BM25 and the same number of clicks, we'll get the same error on the first position and on the last position, which is not matching our observation of how customer behave. So we, we need to introduce the position into the error function. Of course, we can reintroduce, like reimplement a wheel and to create our own ranking function, but the whole industry is usually using, using something called in DCG, which is like an error function for ranking, which is focused on the position of your error. And Technically, it's it looks a bit scary if you see this formula, but it just can, uh, the final in DCG is a number between zero and one. And when it's one, it means that your ranking was perfect. It's like you are Nostradamus who predicted the wonderful, the most perfect ranking for this particular visitor. So, and it's just pretty nicely normalized between zero and one. Um, the cool thing of NDCG is that it's uh, list-wise, so it's based on the whole ranking and not a single row of not a single position like mean square error, for example. And it takes the original ranking and tries to, and compares it with the perfect ranking. Original, for, for example, here, like original ranking, we got a click on position two and probably in a perfect ranking, if we had a crystal ball to predict the future, this item should be ranked first because it was clicked in the future. We just made an error ranking it second. Uh, so that's in DCG. And the cool thing is that you're focusing on the, in DCG, there is quite a lot of tooling for uh, applying it to your learn to rank models. It's implemented in XGBoost, like a peer-wise in DCG, uh, thingy, also in light GBM and cat boost, and you can just take your feature data, mark it with the query data, throw it to XGBoost and get a model and get some sort of results. Uh, if you are on Elasticsearch, you can even have like an Elasticsearch LTR plugin to automate some of the things for you if you want. Uh, but still, um, if you start observing how customer behave when you show them better improved ranking, you might wonder or you might notice that not all items are made the same. This is a histogram for one of our stores uh, of a number of clicks for different products. So this axis is just the product ID. It's just sorted by the frequency. So you see that there are some hot sellers here, and I don't know how to call them, cold sellers. And not all, all products are equal, and your model will probably notice, okay, hot sellers are really hot, they're really being clicked, they're really being sold, let's sell more of a hot sellers and uh, cannibalizing all the cold sellers. So it's like winners will take it all and losers will lose it all, which is pretty logical for the machine learning model, which is based its ideas on the 
product popularities. Uh, but it's not that uh, perfect for your business because usually the hot sellers might have lower margin and you don't want to promote your hot seller. They're already hot, but probably the margin, the most of amount of money lays somewhere here in the losers because they're high, probably high marginal products. Like you're not selling, uh, the hot seller might be... No, I won't be able to make an example on the spot, sorry. But still, you got it. Uh, and then, like a welcome to model bias. And uh, so we, right now, uh, produced a ranking based on our machine learning model and a ranking based on the post clicks. This ranking uh, is fed to the customer, which influences his behavior like he doesn't she doesn't know what she or he going to click on but before the ranking was examined uh, but the position of the click is influenced by the ranking itself and then we collect the, the clicks again retrain our model and repeat again and again just feeding your ranking into the model back back and forth and once we observed an interesting thing happening on one of our stores when we enabled personalization on them. Uh, so at some moment that we just switched the toggle of personalization and like conversion went up. But in time, on each step when the model was retrained, it started degrading. So at the end, it was still better than at the beginning. But still, this degradation pattern was quite common for a lot of merchants. And we were wondering, like, why it's happening? We're all, all doing everything in a, in a proper way, but it's still degrading. And the reason is probably that uh, we uh, poisoned the training data with the model itself. So it was... Uh, amplifying its own ranking errors because these errors were influencing the clicks and it were taken into account like a reference like a ground truth which is not just the clicks are noisy they're extremely noisy and you need to do something with them but it's not the only problem with the training data it's not the only bias you might found find in the training data of your click stream the second one is a position bias. And that's the graph of click position for Findify for April for top 100 stores. And you might, so you see that, top, I've already shown this graph, but the idea is that most of the clicks are happening here on the top five products, which is uh, quite a lot. And once we wondered like how really, uh, position bias influences customer behavior. And we did an interesting experiment, like an A-B test between two segments. One is our default ranking for search, for collections, for recommendations. And the second one is the same one, but the first page is shuffled. Like we randomly shuffled, absolutely randomly without any smart decisions. And so the, and the click position histogram, do you see any difference, Alexei? That's the problem. We also, like, there is a slight difference on the first position, but people are still clicking on the first position, even if the ranking is the total garbage. Yes, they're clicking not as frequent, so they just leave if you show them bad ranking. But the click position might not influence, might not be influenced by their understanding of the ranking. They will still click. They just got used to the Google that it is relevant. They just don't know that we <laughs> spoiled everything. Uh, so uh, the position bias is that people are got used to clicking on top items. Google trained them like the Pavlov's dogs to click on the first items because they're always relevant. And that's just the common noise in your training data when you try start training your mach machine learning model for the ranking. And the relevancy for the click position doesn't matter that much because we have some mental model of the relevancy of the click positions and we use it inside implicitly while thinking where we're going to click. And no one just scrolls down. That's the current state of affairs in ranking. So you might wonder what can we do with this uh, bias problems with our offline learning for the training? when we're just having some simple tools. And 
the first solution will be just to try to estimate this bias. So, okay, our data is biased, but what if we estimate the bias in a way that can we then can we remove it from our data and use it like and get a true relevancy from that? So we have a weight for each click. Uh, in a way that it will just show how important it is and how probable it is. And there is a paper from Google published, I don't know, maybe a three or four years ago. And the idea is there is, uh, they, they defined an idea called inverse propensity weighting. So uh, the propensity is just the probability of the click on different position. So there is a query level propensity when some queries are not discovery queries, but navigational queries. For example, you're searching for food for your cat and you know exactly what you're looking for. You're just typing Royal Canin ta -ta -ta for uh, sensitive for old cats, one kilo, enter. There might be probably a couple of results, but you don't really care about these options. You know exactly what you're looking for, and probably this product is ranked first. So you don't really care about ranking. It's just a pure navigational queries, and for this navigational queries, the average click rank probably will be almost like one, just the first result. So you just don't sample this navigational queries, or maybe even completely remove them. And... Um, there is a second side of the coin is a document level propensity uh, when the weight of the click depends on the position, but how it depends on the position. If you read the paper, they got quite a good results doing applying this technique on Google Drive and Google search or on Google Drive and Google Mail search areas. So, but you're like, it's a very nice idea if you're Google. If you are not Google, you might think that it can can have some pros and cons but for the document level propensity like how can you estimate this propensity for the document and you can uh take a small segment of the traffic like one percent or five percent and shuffle the results there and like observe what's going on and so in this shuffle segment the same product in the same context will be ranked on different positions it means that the true relevancy for this product was constant but customer interacted in a different way for different with this product so at the end you can just aggregate and have some nice uh made some nice decisions based on that so it looks like okay we have product one for query Royal Canin. And so the product one for this query had like 10 clicks on a position one and only one click on the position five. The same for product two for the same query for product one for the another query and so on. But it still looks like a decaying thing. And this decaying thing is not dependent on the relevancy because relevancy for this particular product should be constant for this query because it's the same product for the same query, but just displayed on different positions. Then you can like make it relative and aggregate. And at the end, you got some sort of an, a click probability based on the position, considering that these clicks uh, doesn't depend on relevancy. So this is technically our propensity that we can use for the weighting of our clicks. So it means uh, so. Uh, so it means that each click, uh, so the click on the first position, is not that important from the propensity perspective because the probability of this click is quite high. But the click on the somewhere in the middle of the ranking is much more available and has much more weight based on the propensity which we just estimated. But still, it's a wonderful idea, but it has some pros and cons. Uh, because this estimation depends on the context, because this uh, probability of click might not be uh, a constant for the whole store, for the whole queries, or maybe it should be constant for search and collections and recommendations. Probably it's different. Maybe it's different for different product collections or different search queries. And the more context queries, the more contexts you have to compute this propensity, uh, more data is needed. And more data is needed, uh, the more the need, uh, if you don't estimate it properly, or you just decide to estimate only a single propensity for the whole site, then you might accidentally introduce yet another 
algorithmical bias and who knows what will happen if you leave it as is. And also, if you need to shuffle your search results, shuffling is an expensive operation. Expensive not from the computation perspective, but expensive through the money because uh, shuffling will uh, bounce some customers from your store. So if you shuffle 5% of the traffic for one month, it means that you will somehow reduce your sales in, a, in some, some minor amount of money, but still it can be noticeable from your top management and they might not be that happy about that. And But for Google, it's an, another story because it's, they were focusing on Google search or Google Drive and Google and Gmail search. So you're not going to uh, close your Google Drive because the document was ranked on some weird position. So they're fine. But we are not Google. We cannot afford it because we're on e-commerce. And each bounce session on search means lost money. That's a sad story. But as our production training data, the click stream coming from production is biased. What can we do? Um, and the, the biasing this production data is hard. Why are we so locked on the offline learning? Why don't we switch to something better like for online learning? And so welcome to the reinforcement learning. Uh, there's a process of having slides in HTML. You can put GIFs there. Um, so the reinforcement learning is literally consists of two stages. The first stage is explore. You poke with real people and see how they react to your to your interactions. So if you're talking about ranking, you rank by popularity, rank by price, rank by review count, and see how customer will behave and react to this ranking. And then if you collect enough knowledge from the explore stage, you start exploiting it to, um, to use it to get some better results. But you, for, you need to define what is better for this particular reinforcement learning system, because it's the core of the thing is how you define reward, reward for the system. And all the reward stuff uh, and, and reinforcement learning goes back to the problem of multi-arm bandits. And multi-arm bandits, it's just a slot machines in Casino. Like a single arm bandit is a single slot machine, but you have a row of them. And that's a multi-arm bandit. You're playing on this multi-arm bandit and you don't know the pro winning probability for each machine. Your goal is to maximize the money, the amount of money won. So you start throwing coins randomly uh, to different slot machines and start writing down your estimation of the winning probability. And then if you have enough of estimations, you start exploiting this knowledge. But how, what's your strategy of exploiting the knowledge of probabilities? So the simplest approach will be greedy. So you have an average uh, winning rate of a slot machine and you only play on the single slot machine with an highest average winning rate. It seems okay because you focus on the best machine, probably. But what if your original estimation was wrong? So there is an absolute greedy, which means that uh, most of the time we play on the machine with the highest average uh, winning rate. But sometimes we still play randomly just to see uh, where we write about our original estimation. So it's some sort of a balance between exploration and exploitation in reinforcement learning. But uh, there is another approach to this problem, like it's called lean UCB, a linear upper confidence bound. That it means that we don't really need to split our exploration and exploitation stages at all, and we can fuse them together and do exploring and exploiting at the same time in the same iteration. How, you might wonder, by choosing the bandit with the highest upper confidence bound of the success rate. So not an average, but highest upper confidence bound. So for example, imagine that we have three slot machines and this one, like on average, is the best. But this one is a dark horse. You don't know what can it, what can it give to you. So uh, on average, probably not that much. But in theory, if you're optimistic enough and start playing on this, you might get the better payout at the end. So you start playing on this particular, particular slot machine with the highest up, upper confidence bound. And if you're right, 
you got a cookie. Like, okay, I have a picture here. You got a cookie. But if you're wrong, uh, the, mm, the upper confidence bound will go down, 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 because the more you play, the more confident you are about this bound itself, the more narrow it becomes. And at some moment, you might understand that, okay, my bet was wrong. I need to switch to another machine with a better upper confidence bond, for example, to this one or to that one. But still, you're switching machines and doing exploration, exploitation at the same time. And in theory, it might produce the optimal solution for the multi-arm bandit problem, like mathematically. But uh, in practice, it's not always the truth. Like, how do you define this upper confidence bond? Um, so Lean UCB is a nice idea, but how can you go from multi-arm bandits to ranking? Because um, what is an arm? How can you trigger an arm in ranking? Because it's just ranking, there are no arms. Maybe the document itself is an arm. It might work nice if you have your document space is not that huge. So for example, you are ranking news blog, news articles, and you have like 20 articles for today and you can show all of them randomly like top dif different articles randomly and see how uh, audience behaves with these documents and then just rank them in a good way but what if your uh, document space is so huge that you cannot just show all the documents to different people like you have 16,000 genes and uh, maybe you should focus on a machine learning feature like the feature of this document as an R and then there is like an interesting idea based on this observation called cascade lean UCB which defines your scoring function like a linear model you have features feature values like I don't know price review score or whatever and all of them are have some weights and on each iteration you choose some random weight or not that random weight through your lean UCP algorithm and start poking with this weight, like increasing it up or down and see how and observe the reward, not just compute it directly from the customer behavior, but just observe it. It's literally and just repeat on each iteration. You just start poking with this parameter, that parameter up, down and compare it with the reference model and see what really affects your target reward. The cool thing with observable reward, it, ah, so it means like it's like a A-B test on steroids. In a proper, like a regular A-B test, you define your segments man manually. They are fixed in stone and static, but here algorithm defines the segments for you in real time based on the past behavior it observed. It created a couple of segments and started showing it to different customers and observe the how, observe the reward. The reward here is observed and it's nice that we can uh, plug any type of reward because it's just anything we can observe. Reward goes up, so our business metrics go up. Yeah, that was a nice decision. We need to go further like with increasing the weight of this particular feature or decreasing, so it's up to us. Um, it's a nice idea in general, and there are but there are some pros and cons for this approach. The most wonderful thing of the Cascade Lean UCB is that your reward doesn't really depend on score, so you can throw anything that sticks and anything which is really important to your company uh, in the ranking. So it can be, for example, CTR of the search CTR. Like, okay, if we uh, focus more on ranking by price and CTR goes up, uh, and we sure in it because it's still an A-B test with some confidence interval, that's a nice approach to the reinforcement learning because it's trivial to implement and trivial to run and trivial to improve the what is really important to your company. It can be a mix of different objectives like, okay, CTR and conversion. And uh, it can be also a thing like a, like a click probability. So the reward is not that uh, like a click position or uh, but reward can be like did customer made a click on this ranking because all the models which are focused on in DCG doesn't uh, really do anything about bounces and for us like when there is a hard position bias and people are still clicking on the same places 
disregarding all our smart as learn to rank approaches, it's an interesting reward to optimize for, like to optimize to the number of clicks at the end, because probably it will improve our bounce rate and improve the conversion at the end. It's still a linear model, so it's absolutely trivial to explain to your management, like, okay, we are just uh, using these parameters to wait, and they can even tune it if they want. Uh, but the problem is that as we need to observe our target reward from the real customers interacting with our site, it means that it takes quite a lot of time to converge. So and technically, there's no way for it to converge because probably customer behavior is different and it's changing in time. There is some sort of seasonality or just some drift in the customer behavior. And it just takes forever. But the nice thing that this algorithm can still handle that, it just can tune these parameters in time in the future. And the last thing is that's just still a linear model. If there is some sort of a non-linearity in your data or you have uh, correlated features, uh, it can be tough to properly deal with it. So it's very sensitive and very fragile for the feature normalization, for the feature correlation, and for non-linear non dependencies between features. Uh, but what if we can trade a bit of a flexibility of ch on choosing the reward for the better focus on the click positions? Maybe uh, we can plug the reward differently, directly in our weights. So we don't need to spend months on, on this model to converge. Then like uh, there is an interesting article uh, about the model called PDGD, like a pair of, ah, so, okay. So the idea is that we can um, define our reward as an in DCG, look, we are optimizing directly for the ranking, for the position of the click in the ranking. It might be not a perfect idea for all the use cases, but for some of them, why not? Why not just to try and see how it will affect our ranking? The problem is that you cannot compute gradient over in DCG and because it's not smooth. Uh, but there are some hacks and tricks how to handle it. So we replace in DCG, which is not smooth, with something which is smooth. And the smooth thing is called a pairwise loss. So the algorithm itself is, I'm not going to define, describe you the algorithm completely, but it feels like a stochastic gradient descent but the loss itself is uh, pairwise. The pairwise I means that we receive a click from our customer while on, over the ranking we produced, and we use the position of the click to directly update the weights of our ranking for each click iteratively. Yeah, it might drift a bit in time because there is a lot of noise in these clicks. But the cool thing of this model is that it quite nicely adapts and much faster to converge in general for for your to, to optimize for the reward. Um, I mentioned that it uses a pairwise loss as a replacement for in DCG. What what's that? So uh, if you're training a linear regression and you're focusing on mean square error. So you can see your ranking as like a list of, like you have a list of five products and you got clicks on third and fourth. So your ranking formula produced like the score of 0 0.61 for the product three and product four like 0 0.20, but we got clicks on those positions. So our feedback to the model means that, okay, you was wrong. It's not 0 0.61. It should be one because there was a click and you were wrong. So you compute the mean square error between these numbers. But what will happen if, uh, what do we really care about the absolute value of this number? Because uh, we don't really care if it will be uh, 0, 061 or 161 it could be like 181, 179, 161 at the same ranking, but the absolute values of the score is different. What we really care is the relative difference between the, uh, uh, the score values, the ranking values. So for this, the same situation, we really do care that the score of product three should be more than the score of product one. We don't really care about the absolute value. We only care that it should be 
more. So it should be ranked higher than the product one because this got click and this got nothing. So that's the pairwise loss, which is used to update the weights for each click. So it's you literally just drifting in a space time, updating features for your linear model in, like in real time. Uh, in practice, it means that you're much faster to converge because you don't need to observe something which might happen or might not and get it uh, in some confidence. You just um, you just update your features like right here. Uh, but the problem is that you traded the converge convergence time for the flexibility of choosing the reward. So you it's focused on NDCG. You cannot put conversion there or CTR. And that's like a sad thing for some situations, but it's still nice that you have an options to choose from. It's still linear model, so it's easy to explain. So it has the same issues with the linear model as our previous cascade lead UCB model, but now it's more real time and not trying to observe anything. It just improves in real time right now. Uh, but as we're ready to trade off some of the flexibility of our models for the better quality for the NDCG, we can also trade uh, for the linear, yeah, linearity. <laughs> Ah. So for the model to be linear, we can go non-linear and use something more smart. There is an interesting article from Amazon about the way they do ranking right now. It's quite a fresh one, maybe half a year old. And for, for the people who ever tried to train a recommender system, they know that it's like a trendy thing in a recommender system for the last uh, 10 years is matrix factorization. And for the matrix factorization, it's like they took the idea of matrix factorization and applied it to the ranking. So um, they are not trying to compute this mean square error for recommendations. They like plug pairwise loss to your matrix factorization in a way that and make it online. So you generate and items like candidates, you receive the feedback from customers, and then you update your matrix factorization model based on the pairwise loss of your uh, feedback. And then you can use the, the, the factorized matrices for items and users to make further predictions about your ranking. So it's like combining all the good things and all the nice ideas from different papers together into a single super complex model. For people who never saw the matrix factorization, that's a diagram like, uh, like drawing like I'm retarded, sorry. Uh, but the idea for this diagram is that you have a matrix of interactions between users and items. So each cell in this matrix is an interaction and probably it's a very, very sparse matrix. For most of the users, they don't interact with all the items, probably. So you have a lot of holes in this matrix. And you do a trick here. You uh, try to decompose with matrix into other matrices, like a smaller user-specific matrix and item-specific matrix, that if you multiply them together, you will get a prediction on each like hole in this original matrix. Mm. The cool thing that if you do this uh, factorization, factorization like the decomposing of the matrix to this user item matrices and composing it back, it means that you might plug some different types of loss. So in, in the case of CPR, this collaborative pairwise ranking, they're using the pairwise loss and they're also defining some explicit and hidden features here, like you can do with recommendations. So explicit user feature is like, okay, the country of the user, the current day for the user, for item, it can be like price or conversion value and so on, but weights for explicit features and the hidden features are trained in the process of matrix factorization. So at the end, you will get just a perfect prediction which product should be ranked how for different users. So it becomes really personalized. Of course, you can make uh, this uh, cascade lead UCB model personalized. These features cannot only be the, uh, linked to the product, but also to the customer itself. Like, okay, is it a returning customer or not? Does this customer sell this product or not? It doesn't really important, can be still personalized. 
but it takes uh, the CPR model takes the personalization on another level. So it's much more nonlinear and much more sensitive to behavior of the customer. So in practice, the math behind CPR is a bit more complicated than for the other problem of the other, problem, other solutions I uh, spoke about. And it's still focusing on pairwise loss. It's not focusing on the bounce rate or some business metrics. And for me, it's not really clear how you can uh, combine it uh, in a way that it can fo more focus on the business features and the explainability. Yeah, you know, it's a metrics factorization. It's good luck in explaining uh, how you factorize matrices to your management. <clears throat> So that's literally the state of reinforcement learning and learned rank. Um, and um, the main, main maybe outcome of the talk is that there is no single uh, silver bullet for different models. Different models have different strengths and pros and cons. And you, most of them, most of the research is focused on NDCG. And for my opinion that you shouldn't really focus on NDCG that much because in DCG is not really a business metric because we, we observed a couple of cases when for a, for a store and DCG on A-B test went up, but business metrics went down because people started clicking less frequently. Yeah, when they were clicking, they were clicking in a better on a higher positions, but they started clicking less and clicking less means lower CTR and means that higher bounce rate and higher and lower conversion, which is like a very sad situation for an e-commerce company. Uh, so focusing on convert on business metrics is quite hard, but you still need to uh, keep it in mind when building a recommender systems and not you and not uh, follow the hype of NDCG optimization because it can be still a hype. Uh, so what can you do right now? Like what you need to define what reward is really important to your company. What, how, what are you optimizing at the end and why it is important? And maybe just combine different model in a way that they can combine strength together of the models. So you can also optimize for NDCG and for conversion and for so on and so forth. So different models just uh, allow each other to shine and to improve. Um, that's literally the whole talk uh, about uh, reinforcement learning and search because there's quite a lot of the research happening right now, but I'm just limited in time. I cannot speak for three hours, but if I had a chance, I, I would. <laughs> um, um, so currently I'm working on a like a uh, evening project, an open source project to to make something which might allow people to have a smart ranking without uh, re-implementing a wheel for 1,000th time to compute different type of features for ranking systems and to try different ranking algorithms. So it's MetaRank. It's a like a toolbox or maybe an app which can... It's just a personalization engine. It takes the feedback from your store, from your website, like clicks, what was displayed to the customer, how customer interacted, where it clicked, what it searched for. And then it somehow aggregates it, prepares the features, and you can define what is really important to your ranking. The product is in a super early stage. You can maybe ask some questions and poke with the code, but don't run it even on staging because it's uh, the tests are green here, but don't trust tests here. That's still broken. Uh, so that's my current uh, area of interest, make uh, ranking more affordable for uh, royal people without uh, <laughs> without PhD, like for regular people. Uh, so that's all uh, for my talk. Uh, slides are available on my site. It probably will be shared somewhere in the in the channel. It's me on LinkedIn. Follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, and the meta rank is itself on GitHub. It's completely open source and broken, but you still can poke and read some docs because there are docs. <clears throat> That's all. Uh, so you can ask questions if there are questions, and I'm, I'm not sure. I don't have a Slack code. <laughs> uh, hi. 
Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so can I take derp learning for 300? Yeah, derp learning 300. So, okay, <laughs> go, go for it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, we have actually a couple of questions in Slider and they want to remind if you are watching it live right now. And there is a pinned link in live chat. You click on this so you can ask a question. And there are already six questions. So if there is a question you want to ask, you can just support. And um, yeah, so I think we can start with the most supported one. Um, are there any extensions of UCB which could include environmental factors or variables? And do you recommend uh, other easily explainable reinforcement learning algorithms for this purpose? Uh, environmental, what does it mean? Like environmental, like the weather? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess not. But the, let's say uh, disregard environmental, but include uh, like all factors, variables that you have uh, about user behavior or um, basically any it's, features. It's, it, it's still a linear system. So you're free to choose any features you want there. So it can be specific to, it, it's the most easier thing is to throw something from the product metadata, like conversion rate for this product or price or whatever. But still it can be mm, uh, from another scope from, from the customer, or it can be from the scope of query, like, okay, a feature number of words in the query. It's not scoped to the item, or it's not scoped to the user, or it can be a combination of both. Okay, we are trying to score a product for a particular query, but does this product title contains the query, for example, or product tags? So it's up to you. This these models are itself quite generic, and they're not focused on the exact feature values. You can throw anything there, even temperature outside, which is quite cold. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. <laughs> so you can actually include the environmental variables in any sense, right? including temperature outside. Because I think, like for e-commerce, <laughs> it can actually uh, it can actually matter, right? Probably yes, but we never tried. So I don't. I won't okay. be able to answer this question. Okay, maybe this is something you can add to your backpack for the next talk. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> what do you think about the potential of explainable reinforcement learning algorithms in credit risk domain? Mm. If you ever <clears throat> thought about this? I thought, like, because explaining what's going on is also an interesting uh, area. So. I got a feeling that uh, the more complex that the model be becomes, the more hard it is to explain what's going on. And so it depends on the model type. So for example, for the slam de mart and for the tree ensemble based models, you can have some sort of an estimation on what's going on. Like for each feature, you can see how frequently it's used in this ensemble of trees. And so you might assume that, okay, it's used almost in the second tree, like 50% of the trees, that it means that this feature is important. And this feature, which is used only in 1% of the trees, is not that important. But for matrix factorization, good luck explaining it. Uh, so that's th there is yet another approach of explainable machine learning that you take your complicated, nonlinear, uh, crazy model and uh, build a an imposter model based on that. Like you took a regression with the same feature parameters, but just uh, this regression is straight on the output of your model. Probably it will be not that good uh, in general, uh, but it would be good enough to understand what feature are really important for your model. It won't catch non-linearities and so on and so forth, but still you will get an overview like and a feeling about what's going on and what's really important. And there's always like a way to do a, a YOLO style discover of feature importance by removing features from the model and see how it behaves. So it's up to you. I really like the approach of uh, building an like imposter model for, for, for just for the explainability. You cannot tune this model because it's just a copy but still it's enough to be understood.
-hmm. like what, what is important. But it's still as a linear model, it can be can have problems with explainability if there are correlated features and so on. So it can be not not a regression, not a linear model, but like a like a tree ensemble model, but which is still somehow explainable, but good enough on handling correlated features. Mm -hmm. So uh, this question is also interesting because in credit risk uh, scoring, uh, when you make a decision if you want to reject somebody or like, give a loan to somebody or not, you have this uh, feedback loop you were talking about, right? So for people you reject, you don't know how they would, uh, like maybe they would have uh, actually paid back the credit. Uh, uh, so yeah. if there is any uh, maybe research that you came across at some point that... Uh, tries to address this problem uh, because I imagine it's in a way similar except that feedback loop is uh, a lot longer than in search. Yeah, the good thing of e-commerce is that the feedback loop is quite quite narrow. For credit risk, it can take a year until a person mm -hmm. decides not to return the loan. <laughs> but uh, I'm just out of business of credit scoring mm -hmm. for the last five years, so just not following the research on that mm -hmm. thing. But I remember there was a decision, the, the discussion on this data talks channel about that, like mm -hmm. in the previous week or something. Okay, yeah. Um, how to measure uh, how many customers we lose when we experiment with different rankings? Because uh, there is, uh, like when we do this uh, exploration, right? When we uh, try some random stuff, we inevitably lose people. So how do we measure how many people we lose? Through the A-B test, usually. So mm -hmm. you still run it. So if you, so for us, we do all this propensity measurements and all these experiments in an A-B test controlled environment. So we, if we do like a feature toggle, like shuffle the first page and it's it's just plugged into the A-B testing system. So we know exactly, so it's just marked each session for a user, which was receiving shuffled ranking is marked with a special tag that, okay, this user came from, came to the shuffled ranking. So you can just analyze it at the end. Mm -hmm. So like A-B test as usual, like estimating how much, it depends on the vertical. It depends on your customers. Because for me, like we have uh, hundreds of different large stores on our platform, and there are now two similar stores. It's all different. So it can be 1% drop for one store, and it can be 50% drop for another. Because uh, the feature, uh, the, the feature of search and the feature of ranking. Like the why, why do is different. For some stores, it's just pure navigational thing. If you're buying um, food, you probably buying the same food once uh, every week. So you are not going too much of a discovery. Discover when you type the, your like the milk name in a search box. So for these cases, maybe it won't matter at all. But if you're selling clothes or something with like customers don't really know what they're looking for, yeah, the cost can be quite high. So um, you can just have a small segment, which can be and your uh, uh, destruction uh, strategy can be not as hard like okay, you take 5% of the traffic and reduce the conversion for 3% out of this five. So in, ge in general, it's not that high, mm -hmm. the, like the blast radius of your tests. I'm wondering how would you convince the, the management to go for this? I imagine it's pretty difficult to say, hey, we're taking randomly 5% of our users and we on purpose we make the rankings bad so we can see how they react and uh, we will lose money, but uh, yeah, we want to do this. So how do you sell this to the management? You can say like, okay, we introduced the bug accidentally and the ranking was shuffled for 5% of the traffic for two weeks. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but we found an interesting thing in the spoiled data and go for it. But okay. it, it's up to the management. So, but okay. uh, 
on average, if the blast radius is not that huge, that should be fine. Mm -hmm. So don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. <laughs> In some cases, yes. <laughs> okay. But still, but still, if you focus on conversion in general, it can have some random fluctuations in time, even for large stores. So if you go down for 0.01%, and you even can measure it, but still uh, it fluctuates for 1% up and down each week, it's just a noise. So you don't lose a lot of money. And if you measure the conversion, precisely enough that you know that, okay, I'm, we are probably going to lose 5% uh, for the whole segment, but the segment is quite low. You can even multiply the conversion by the, the value of the customer. So you can even have an uh, estimation of the money you are going to lose on the store, on, 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 this, on this experiment. So, okay, it will cost us like 2000 euro. Okay, that's the cost. But okay, we're buying peanuts for three. So why don't we experiment with our traffic then? <laughs> you know, maybe also explaining the benefits, like potential gain in the future. But, also... Yeah, it's also a potential benefit. But if you have some sort of an absolute, absolute estimation of how we are going, how much money we're going to lose, it can be understandable. Maybe the, just the number is not that huge. Mm -hmm. Do you have time for a couple of more questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, what were some of the aspects uh, the, that used to promote better exploration, uh, curiosity, or novelty in online reinforcement learning settings while still balancing for relevancy? I'm not able to find the... Where are you reading these comments? Okay. Like, so let so, me... uh, so it, yeah, it I think really, it's... It was really hard for me to catch it. Oh, yes. yeah. Questions. Okay. So the, this is the highlighted question. Uh, where were some of used to promote bird or exploration careers to the old the land? For relevancy, like the lean UCB is just the approach to have some sort of an automatic balance between the exploration and exploitation. But it's up to you how you define your reward and how you define the upper confidence bound of this reward. But there are some algorithms about that. So, like this. Yeah, do you have uh, any experience uh, with uh, using reinforcement learning for time? time. Uh, I guess it's time series? Or... It, uh, I don't know what time data set it is. It's not really important. If your agent can uh, interact with you, so it's not, just your, it's not just your observation. So if you are receiving a time stream of purchases happening on the stock market, probably you won't be able to interact with this market in the way that you can see how it reacts because the market is huge and you are so small. But in some cases, if you can interact and you can see the reaction, like why not? It's not really tied to the, to the, the time or it's like a time data set or not. So it's just if you can observe the reaction, if you can poke your system with some stick and see how it reacts why not okay, so it can be anything can be time series or anything else like yeah owners. yeah okay reinforcement learning is getting popular these days and i think it will be even more popular and it will be the most popular algorithm in 2013 so what do you think about this mm -hmm. Probably I agree, yeah. disagree. <laughs> in 2030, there can be some yet another hype algorithm. Okay, so something else in, in, that... invented. Like now, it's like a deep neural networks. Just mm -hmm. thro throw PyTorch on it until it sticks. <laughs> okay, so we'll see in uh, ten years, right? Yeah, yeah. So what loss to use if flipping products ranked 1 and 10 is worse than 1 and 2? As most users click on top 5, this seems more relevant than pairwise loss. Uh, so it's not more about flipping, but more about the, the relevant difference in the score. So um, if we're talking about pairwise loss between product 1 and 10, it, we should just be sure that it's just 
product one is ranked higher than product 10. We don't care about the absolute value of the scoring. Uh, so for one and two, it's, it's, it's hard to define pairwise loss in just for a couple of products. It's just like a, you need to, to have a list on that. You're computing pairwise loss over, over the list of products and not just over two. So it's just hard for me to answer this question. Like you, you yeah. can you, you can use any loss you want, but like in the industry, it's pairwise loss is quite popular. That's the only thing I can see. But you are not really tied to the pairwise loss. If there is something better, go for it. Like, but I'm not that smart to to implement my own collaborative pairwise ranking with some yet another type of loss because there's just too many integrals there. Yes, thanks. Thanks everyone for asking questions. And I want to remind if you're watching this uh, in recording, now you can ask uh, questions in the uh, events uh, Q&A uh, channel. So just go there, ask your question there and Raman uh, will uh, keep an eye on this for a couple of days and will um, answer the questions and also maybe if you want to talk about some of the questions that you ask today but want to get some more in-depth uh, explanation maybe uh, feel free to go there and ask your question and uh, thanks uh, Raman for coming today for joining uh, today uh, sharing your knowledge uh, with us thanks everyone for joining and for listening in for watching and asking questions and uh, come on Friday we will talk about uh, interviewing. Um, so, yeah, that's all for today. Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you for the invitation. Yes. Uh, Ho hopefully, I will speak about something else later. Yeah, we are looking forward. <laughs>